Welcome to The Property Couch, where each week you get to listen to two of Australia's leading experts. Bryce Holdaway, co-host of Location, Location, Location Australia on Foxtel's Lifestyle Channel. Co-host of Escape from the City on the ABC and partner of Empower Wealth Advisory. Ben Kingsley, Chair of Property Investors Council of Australia and the founder of Empower Wealth Advisory. Named the 2018 and 2019 Property Advisory Firm of the Year. Stay tuned as they bring you the Insider's Guide to Property, Finance and Money Management. All right, folks, welcome back to The Property Couch. Welcome back to you too, Ben. How are you going? Good, mate. You, you sound a little croaky. Everything all um, right? A little croaky, mate. I've had the uh, I've had the check, so I don't have coronavirus, but um, I've certainly got a little lurgy, so that's not, not a lot of fun, I've got to say. No. I am um, looking forward to today's chat. We've got um, a very special guest on today, Ben, which is continuing our theme of chatting to the presidents around the country. We've got the president of the Real Estate Institute of WA, who's also a good friend of the property couch, Damien Collins. Mm-hmm. Yes, no, I can't wait for that chat. So before we get there, folks, a couple of things. Um, we recently did a ABC, uh, ABCD in a pandemic episode. So just how we update the pillars so that you can fine tune them during the times that we're at. So the wonderful team here uh, behind the scenes has put together a free report, Ben, so you can get access to that. So anyone who's interested in the keynotes from that particular episode on how they can use that as a supplementary guide to the TPC 20, um, that you can download. All you need to do is go to thepropertycouch.com.au forward slash ABCD pandemic. Mm. Uh, ben, that's thepropertycouch.com.au forward slash ABCD pandemic. And you can get free access to that, Ben, which uh, hopefully mm. will give people some um, some really genuine and valuable takeaways to help them build their portfolio during this environment. Brilliant. Hey, um, my mindset minute today, Ben, is pretty much along the lines of your general uh, update that you do at the end of every podcast, Ben. What do you say? Knowledge is empowering, but only if you act on it, Ben. So yeah. um, I've got this one from, you know, Dr. Phil? Uh, oh, yes, yes. TV. You, yep. I'm sure you've watched hours and hours yes. of Dr. Phil, Ben. Talk show host, <laughs> um, Dr. Phil. Mm-hmm. Oh, very good. I'm impressed. Hey, Phil inside, Donovan Ben. Or Donahue or Donahue? What was it, Donahue? Oh, keep going. Oh, let's yeah, riff them up. Keep going. No, that's just the, you, you just missed the, 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 the biggest one of all. What's that? It's wrong. Oprah. Oh. <laughs> yeah, so I thought, I thought you started to riff them off. Hey, uh, Dr. Phil says this, Ben. Insight without action is worthless. Right. Insight without action is worthless. So ponder that, Ben. No, that's a, <laughs> that's a layup in terms of <laughs> makes complete sense to me. Makes complete sense to me. So no, very good. I like that one. Nice. Short and sweet, but powerful if, uh, uh, if people sweet. follow it. I'm always happy to have feedback from you, mate. I'm often, <laughs> I'm often sort of give you a little nudge to make sure you're not snoozing off in some of these segments, but uh, good to see you, you're a part of it. But um, yeah, we, we previously caught up with uh, Damien Collins uh, just recently, Ben, and uh, we had a really, really good conversation, didn't we, about uh, not only uh, what he's seeing as the role of the president of the Real Estate Institute of Western Australia, but also some of the insights from being on the ground in the WA market. So I reckon we should cut to that interview, Ben. Uh, as we chat to Damien Collins, the president of the Real Estate Institute of WA. All right, Ben, today we've got a very special guest. We have the president of the Real Estate Institute of Western Australia. Welcome to the Property Couch, Damien Collins. Great to be here, Bryce. Good to see you both again, even virtually. <laughs> yeah, even virtually. But, uh, mate, that's changed. We had you on our podcast back in episode 73. In fact, you were our very first vodcast, which was the combination of video and podcasting back in episode 73 but uh, mate that's changed since we chatted with you being the president of the real estate institute of wa first of all congratulations and uh secondly what um what has that meant to your life since you've taken on that role you know you're juggling a successful business there and also taking on that hat it must be um must be a busy time yeah i, th- I think i've got two kids but i haven't seen them for a couple of about a year and a half uh, uh, no it has been look i've enjoyed the role of a uh, year and a half into it now and uh uh, obviously, the last uh, the last six or seven weeks, uh, the workload has um, has pretty much tripled. Obviously, there's so much going on in real estate with the market and legislation changes. So, uh, but I really do enjoy it. Uh, it's good to advocate on behalf of the industry and uh, and uh, yeah, certainly the workload in the last uh, it's gone from uh, maybe day and a half a week to about five days a week in the last few months. But uh, no doubt it'll come back down again soon. 
Yeah, well, we're going to get onto that. But, uh, mate, normally, I'm going to be really transparent and honest here, but normally I'd be very excited at the fact that I'm talking to a fellow sand groper, you know, someone over the Nullarbor in my hometown of WA. Um, but that excitement is very much tempered by the fact that um, uh, I'm more He's concerned about... Man. I'm more He's concerned about turning my mind. back, more concerned about turning my back and worrying about you and Ben as Collingwood supporters <laughs> hitting me from behind. Well, uh, Bryce, I'm just uh, sad the season hasn't started because, uh, you know, watching Dockers lose uh, seven or eight home games, <laughs> but, uh, as always, I, I get to go. Rewa actually, uh, we uh, host our members at the, and I always get the Dockers games. And uh, so it's sad to see. Lucky uh, you. Uh, but look, I think, you know, I think the season, Collingwood were second on, you know, we're, we're going to win this year. So mate, how did you become, I mean, we covered this before, but seriously, mate, how did you become a Collingwood supporter? Ser- anyway. well, I'm actually, I am ex-Victorian. I uh, grew up in Melbourne and... Uh, he took spent- his wisdom and he spread it to the West, right? Yeah, right. Like most wow. great Victorians, we go out and we spread the word. Oh, gosh. Conk- All right, let me know when you two are finished. But um, <laughs> let's, let's, uh, let's, let's hook Get in. Get into the real stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Let's hook in. But, uh, mate, we're excited to have you on because clearly you've got a lot of experience in the property game. You've got a lot of experience in the Perth property market. But one thing about you is um, you're the president of the peak industry over there. So you're always you're always um, uh, putting yourself in positions where you're not just sort of, uh, you know, making yourself only known in, in uh, the property market itself. You, you've got a real broad view of, uh, of property right across this country and your views are well sought after. But... Uh, Mate, clearly we're in an environment where uh, we're all affected by a health challenge. So I, I guess we're keen to kick it off and get a better understanding of what, what, is that, what does that actually mean to on the ground in Perth, um, given that the backdrop of the last five years has been, has been a challenging time. So we're, we're super keen to hear your insights. Yeah, Bryce, it sure has been. Uh, I think uh, the market is, quite logic say it's down 21% over that time. And uh, Look, we were just starting to pick up. The immigration was uh, returning from overseas, uh, going back to sort of middle of last year, and the exodus. You know, WA was losing 4,000 people a quarter. That had really started to taper off. It was only 1,000 a quarter. So, And the oversupply we had from all the building was pretty much taken up. We got down to 12,000 uh, properties for sale, which is is below um, what you would call a balanced market. So it started to become a seller's market for the first time. That was probably October last year. So we saw a bit of price... Uh, Firming, I wouldn't say massive increases. We probably saw maybe one to two percent in general, but there were some areas that probably up the the, uh, the higher priced, the more affluent areas, probably up five or six percent over the last three to four months. Uh, but COVID, of course, has uh, now uh, killed that off. We've got uh, our transactions are down from seven hundred a week in Perth to two hundred and sixty the last few weeks. So, uh, look, I think realistically, prices at best will uh, will hold until this is uh, more settled. They might even go backwards potentially a little bit. But given the fact we've already come off, we've um, already been so low for so long, I can't see them plummeting here. I think we might drop a few percent perhaps. But it just it will depend on how quickly we come out of it. No one can really be certain uh, for sure. So well, it's, a bit of pill, it's a bit of pill for you to swallow. But um, prior, you know, we will dive into COVID a bit more shortly. But um, what, to help people who, who don't necessarily understand the Perth economy um, and the Perth market well, what... What was what was what was causing um, that market to sort of move from its downturn into a, a more of a balanced market, and what what were the things that were getting you excited about um, you know activity returning to to the Perth or the, the WA market in general? Look, WA and Perth are very much a economic driven city. So um, you know, I grew up in. Um, in Melbourne, and uh, remember, as a kid, people left Melbourne. Uh, if they were leaving Melbourne, they were generally going to uh, go up to Queensland for lifestyle, or down to more recently go down to Tassie for a bit of cheaper property and lifestyle as well. People didn't tend to move to Perth for lifestyle, even though it's got, as you guys know, it's got amazing lifestyle. Amazing. Yeah. yeah, it tends to be job related, and so uh, and so that's what drove the really strong population growth that we saw about five or six years ago. And it was also the reason once the mining construction phase tapered off and uh, went into production, uh, then that's what really caused the exodus of populations. People stopped coming from overseas in such large numbers. And, you know, we were losing 16,000 a year over back over East. So, and at the same time, the uh, former uh, Liberal government put in a first homeowners grant to stimulate building. Well, all that did was uh, bring forward supply. Uh, We had a massive building spike just at the wrong time. And that's why we got stuck with all those properties. Now, the good news is, is that uh, the mining sector is definitely in recovery. 
BHP, Rio, uh, Fortescue um, are all spending big bucks up in the Pilbara. And uh, while there's obviously people on the ground up there and that most of the work is, is FIFO out of Perth, they fly in, they fly out. And uh, so that's been really uh, positive. Iron ore prices have been strong. The government's uh, got our GST back, and um, which, uh, which uh, over here it was uh, very unpopular that we we're only getting 30 cents of the GST. Now we're getting a floor of 70. So the government's got a good balance sheet. So look, things were, and, the, and the, all that excess supply that we spoke about is all being taken up now. So, uh, so it was starting to, um, starting to look good, but, uh, and, um, but definitely if you're into Perth, it is a more volatile market and it's also very much tied to commodities. That's our main industry, 10% of people work in mining, but if you look at all the spin-off sectors, it's, uh, it's probably closer to 20 to 25% when you look at all the lawyers and the other people involved in it. It's, it's, it's our key industry and if that's strong, Perth's strong, if it's not, it's the other way. And Damien, you were mentioning about the supply side. I, I wanted to sort of look at the, the vacancy rate story that's also played out over the last three or four years. That, um, that got quite high, but that was probably one of your other indicators, which was pointing in the right direction in regards to um, the level of vacancy rate. So do you want to share that backstory as well? Yeah, Ben, we had, uh, with all those people leaving, of course, the, uh, the, the, uh, the excess of supply of housing only for sale, but also for rent, our vacancy rate got up to 7.3%. That was quite uh, painful um, for landlords and property managers. Our rent, uh, median rent went down from 460 to about 350. So we're uh, looking at a 25% haircut for landlords. And look, coming into 2018, into early 2019, we got down to under 2% or uh, well, hovering around 2%, I should say. And uh, and that was looking pretty positive. And uh, we thought early in 2019, the rental market was uh, likely to take off. But what happened was we, st- we had a, a good rental market, but we had an excess supply in the sale market. So we went down, f- uh, so a lot of houses that they could, people couldn't sell were brought back into rental market. So kept a lid on our uh, rental price uh, growth over the last 12 months. Uh, but now we're in a situation pre-COVID where both the stock for sale and stock for rent is low. So... So we thought uh, you know, two months ago, I thought we'd see a 20 to $40 rise in rents this year. Uh, and that's unlikely to happen now, given what's going on. But certainly once we come out the other side, uh, we are coming into a, a low vacancy rental market. And Damien, we talk about markets within markets. And, and we even though we know Perth is you know, a, a, a capital city um, and it has sort of you know, the Swan River sort of separating uh, and then the city beach areas and those types of things, Tell us a bit about um, what's happening in the Perth market, but also more broadly in terms of what's happening across the whole Western Australian state, because we have seen some markets perform very, very well um, over the last 12 to 18 months. Where, where have those markets been and, and why have they done so well? And then, you know, what do you think is next for, uh, for some of the other markets? Yeah. Uh, look, I'll start with, uh, with with Perth. It still is a mixed bag, exactly as you say, Ben. It's, you know, look, the, when you talk to the media, they want to know, what's the market going to do? And uh, it's hard to, uh, in sound bites, to get them to understand that there's uh, many markets, with it, particularly in capital cities, markets within markets. So uh, uh, look, the higher end of the market, the more affluent areas, so your Cottesloe, city beaches of the world, the Western suburbs, um, even around the river, South, uh, Apple Cross, and those sort of areas have, they've, they've been uh, picking up for probably eight or nine months now. And uh, it's just got, to, I guess it's got to the point that uh, interest rates were so low, uh, affordability, you could, buy a, you could buy a house in Cottesloe for $2 million. Now, um, that's a lot of money to the average person, but uh, Cottesloe is one of the prime premium suburbs near the beach. And uh, so people were going, well, look, I could borrow back uh, even 12 months ago, I could get a loan for three and a bit percent. Even if I borrow another million dollars, it's only two and a half thousand dollars of roughly a uh, month's payments. So. So uh, it was, uh, it was, people became more confident. That was the main thing. It wasn't, a, we haven't had an affordability issue. It's a confidence issue. Mm. And uh, people felt the mining sector is recovering. Things are looking good. Gonna, I'm going to take that opportunity to upgrade. So that's why that it's all been owner occupied driven rather than investor driven. We haven't seen a lot of investors. Uh, we just start to see them start to trickle back in, uh, in late 2019, early 20, but it was predominantly, it's been an owner occupier market. But, but if you go to the outer suburbs, uh, Beldivis, Allenbrook, uh, areas that uh, we generally don't recommend people buy because for the very reason that's where all the supply is. You can get lots of supply in uh, the fringes and uh, and uh, that's still the real basket case. Unfortunately, a lot of those people are sitting on negative equity. The house and land packages for 450 are worth 370, 380. 
So uh, it's a real pain out there, and um, there's going to be a lot of there's a lot of hidden stock not even listed. So I just think those markets, even pre-COVID, were going to be at least a year or two away, and uh, uh, it's always a problem. Anywhere where new supply can come to the market, you try and keep keep away. The uh, so um, the middle suburbs are okay; they're growing marginally. So you're sort of up the north coast, up the the freeway train lines, your uh, your Heathridges, your Duncraigs, those sort of areas, your middle markets, the uh, Warwicks. Uh, they, they're doing they were doing pretty well particularly anything with the development potential was was, was starting to, to grow and uh, if you get out of wider Perth uh, certainly the Pilbara has been the hot spot uh, in Western Australia over the last uh, last 12 18 months and uh, and it still is even today um, speaking to agents up there Caratha is up prices are up quite significantly uh, and uh, rents are up last quarter the median rent went up 120 dollars a week and that's not in a, a year that's a in quarter. a week. Not a month either, a week. No, sorry, they, in the weekly rent went up $120 in the quarter. So over three oh, months, okay. sorry, yep. median rent went up $120. So it went up from about uh, 450 to 570 very quickly. Now you've got to, I guess, uh, look back at that and um, the history of uh, Carrasa and Port Hedland, as I'm sure many of your viewers uh, would know, they, uh, they went up from uh, very cheap prices to more than a million dollars in many cases. And... Uh, uh, then they came right back. Headland came down 80% and Caratha came down almost 70% from their peaks. But they've come down too low. They are well below replacement. Now, Caratha's caught up probably 25% over the last uh, 12, 18 months. It's getting towards replacement value, probably got another 15% to go. But Headland is way under replacement. You can get houses in, in Headland, uh, South Headland for 200000 And the replacement value up in those regions is about five fifty to six fifty thousand. The simple reason is there's they don't manufacture anything up there. It all comes out of Perth. It's got to go up on trucks. So what what, what you build a house for in Perth for two hundred will cost you at least four hundred to four fifty up there. And uh, so of course there's been no new construction for about four or five years uh, because of that. And housing's below replacement. So long run houses have to go back to that replacement value or depreciated replacement value because that. That at that stage, no one will build until then. So I think um, Headland is certainly the next um, one that's kicking up. The re at the I think the uh, current uh, downturn, uh, so with COVID, uh, you, you've seen already the mining companies who are flying people in and out from um, uh, Mel Melbourne, Sydney, Brisbane. They've stopped that. They've all had to fly out of Perth because our state is in lockdown. But I think from a risk management point of view, I think they're going to want to put more people locally um, because, yeah, hopefully we're going to get over this COVID now, but I think uh, in the longer run, uh, from a risk management point of view, if I'm a mining company thinking, let's say it explodes in Perth and I can't get my workforce out, I want to have a lot of people on the ground. So I think I think they're going to really focus on trying to get more people in those towns rather than uh, everything being FIFA. Damo, is, um, do you, what's your view on the fact that, um, you know, you talked about the Pilbara. The Pilbara has been highly volatile. So, you know, clearly replacement cost is low and there's an opportunity for, for some upside. But um, we had one of the lead uh, real estate agents on our podcast a little while ago and, and sort of gave us the inside look on, you know, what that roller coaster ride looked like. So my question to you, and it's one without notice, but um, do you think that Perth and Pilbara or Western Australia is a good place for people who have a buy and hold strategy or do you think it's a better spot for people to have a buy and sell strategy given that they they need to get the the chunk of the timing right so because you know i've got friends in perth you, you you'd know m m way more than me but um they've had portfolios that have been sitting on for the last decade that haven't performed so the buy and mm. hold hasn't served them well but if they if they got a bit of timing right and took their took their profit and then moved it on do you have a view on that and, and if so what is that well, certainly, Bryce, the Pilbara is definitely a buy and sell. You don't want to be there for the long run. Uh, it's very volatile and uh, the smart money was getting out when it was a million dollars a house. And and uh, I guess some of the smarter money is getting back in now that they're two hundred and twenty, two hundred thirty thousand dollars a house in, in Headland and a bit more in Caratha. Yeah, I definitely wouldn't be. We've had some clients buy up there and our recommendation is it's uh, maybe a three year game and uh, but the chances are you, you know i think you could double your money in in three years which is and if you look at if and that's on the house prices certainly in headland i expect the headland will double in the next three years and carrather won't because it's already had a bit of a run but but yeah i wouldn't want to be there for five or seven years i think it's uh, and look even perth is certainly more volatile i guess uh, looking back uh, 13 years ago in uh, when we had that crazy run up uh, we all thought, yep, it's going to 
flat line for a while and uh, as historically the cities do, but uh, did we expect uh, 13 years later, it would still be in this uh, position? No, uh, it's, uh, it's, you know, prices are much the same as they were 2007. And uh, it's very, very, uh, it's very, very, uh, it's the most affordable city in the country. I mean, our median price from what I last saw in the stats was cheaper than Hobart. Now our average income is about double of uh, Tasmania. So uh, it's, it's very cheap, but look, I guess uh, Perth is still a capital city. It's not, um, it's even though it's a mining focused town, uh, it's still a capital city. It's, it doesn't have those ridiculous um, busts like we saw up in the uh, Pilbara, albeit, you know, the last five years has been the biggest downturn that we've ever seen, and no one would have probably predicted 20%. Look, I think uh, I think uh, it, it will come down to the individual investor, and uh, uh, but I think, uh, you know, looking back historically, um, if you see another run-up of some silly proportions, we got 50 60% in two or three years, which has happened a couple of times, that's a good sign to take your money off the table. If we just bounce along at four or five or six percent, then you would stick at it. But I think uh, the lesson learned from the last uh, 2003 to seven is uh, if it goes silly, take your money off the table because you're going to be waiting a long time before it comes good again. Yeah, I think that's a good tip. I mean, can you help people understand the Perth market? We've hinted that it's, uh, it's a, you know, it's got one product that they sell to China and that's driven by, you know, rocks on trains to, to ships to over there. But how, how, would you, how would you explain to someone who has never been to Perth before how the city works and you know we've got the north and the south divide um when i grew up you'd never jump on a train but now mm. now now it's more of a, a train dominated city um you've got the you've got the golden triangle can you can you sort of get us at the thirty thousand foot level to try and explain just the fundamentals of, of how perth works and what what are some of the things that someone in, in melbourne may make a mistake and bring their melbourne paradigm over to perth or uh, sydney paradigm over to perth that um that you've observed over the journey yeah, Bryce, it's, it's very much a, a very sprawled out city and uh, you've got uh, uh, housing as far as 60 kilometres north and as far as 60 kilometres south. It tends to, Perth hugs the coastline. So we're, uh, we're a sandy flat basin and then there's, uh, uh, if you go east of the city, uh, it's, uh, well, I wouldn't call them mountains, I'd call them hills. <laughs> they're not very big, they're not, very big no. not very big on a world scale, but... Uh, <laughs> Uh, there is some uh, the hills down there. <laughs> so because, because it's been flat sandy, it's been very cheap to build. And the great Australian dream, you know, everyone got their, used to be their quarter acre block, then they went down to 800 metres and 700 and 600 and 500. And now they're down to 350 square metres, even when you're 50, 60 kilometres out. But the, the housing hugs the coast. So being on the west side, uh, people, so western, obviously Melbourne and Sydney, being in the west is uh, has historically been the less preferred part of town. But in Perth, of course, uh, being west and closer to the beach is the preferred part. So, so you've got your uh, more established areas, um, and Perth's got the Swan River uh, running right through the city, uh, comes from those small hills and uh, uh, empties out in Fremantle, out into the ocean. So, so certainly it's always been popular to be around the river, and it is a very beautiful river. I ride my bike around a lot, and uh, and also being on the beaches. So, so the historical. Uh, suburbs uh, that have been around for longest are there uh, the most affluent areas but as you go further north yeah you get up through uh, up through Trigg that's quite a popular area a lot of surfers uh, uh, like that spot uh, even goes further up to Hillary's you've got a marina and now Ocean Reef and even up to nearly Yanchip so it so certainly if you're going to invest or buy in Perth the, you need to, you want to be near the uh, the coast the river and uh, and certainly uh, the beach that's the, uh, the anywhere near a beach people want that but We've, as that sprawl has continued, but start, we're two million people here in Perth now, congestion has started to get a bit worse. So when I first moved here 20 odd years ago, uh, I used to laugh at uh, coming from Melbourne, what people thought bad traffic was, but uh, it's still not as bad as Melbourne, but it is uh, certainly a lot more congested. So, so we've certainly focused on the last, uh, last five or seven years of us buying here for clients is, is been well, even if we don't get market growth, uh, we, we you know, can't always control the market, predict the market, where do we buy that will outperform the market? And it certainly has been around around infrastructure. So uh, the trains, as you said, Bryce, when you were a kid, not many people got the train. A lot of my staff now uh, get the train to work uh, and, the, and the cat buses because uh, parking is is hard. Con we're in West Perth, congestion is, is pretty bad. So so we've really focused around the train lines. Uh, the freeway is uh, is also, there've been a lot of freeway works, but we've been buying, uh, you know, the Forestfield uh, underground train lines going out under the airport. There's a station there out, out to Forestfield. That's an area, 14K of the city, 
uh, it's always been a bit of a hard to, you know, hard to get from because it has had, it's behind the airport, so you have to go around the airport to get anywhere. Uh, but that certainly, I think, uh, infrastructure will really improve that area and you can get houses there for 350 to, to 400. Uh, and the other one is, um, you know, looking at infrastructure, Bayswater Station. Bayswater uh, is on the east side of town. It's, uh, uh, and it's one of the older suburbs, but it is uh, going to get, uh, it's, the, it's a station on the way to uh, uh, the Midland train line. Midland goes out east. Uh, but Bayswater is going to be a hub now for the new Forestfield uh, line coming through. And it's also going to be a hub for the Allenbrook train line, uh, which is in the northeast. So we've got a train line, to, two new train lines coming. One goes out to the east, southeast to the airport and out to the foothills. And the other one goes, will be coming a bit later, is going up north in the in, inland to Allenbrook. Um, and that's coming and starting in about two years. So Bayswater is going to be a, an amazing hub. You know, six or seven k of the city, three train lines going. I tell people regularly. I think that is the most. That'll be the most important train station in Perth outside of the uh, the Metro City train station. So, uh, so, uh, it, but yeah, look, it, it, I certainly, uh, you know, if you're going to go into Perth, you want to be uh, as closest to the coast, to the to the river. Uh, but if you're going to go outside of that, you'd need to be near infrastructure. You don't want to be buying. Because uh, that's what's going to, you know, that's what's going to change. And I think as the city, look, it's had its ups and downs of population growth, but long run average is about 1.8 percent, and uh, we're going to grow from two on that basis. We're going to grow uh, from two million to three, three and a half million over the next 20 odd years. Um, that's going to put us, uh, uh, you know, get closer to Sydney and Melbourne. And you see what's happened there as the city gets bigger and more congested. People put a premium on being close to train lines, uh, and I just, I'm, I'm a big advocate for for buying near there, and I think. Some people in Perth get it. Some people haven't got it yet. But I think if you've got a bit of vision, I think those train lines will be very popular. And not only that, I should say the redevelopment opportunities. That's because if you, we bought a lot of stock around train lines, and you know we knew that the rezoning was going to happen because they want density around train stations, and we've had clients make some really good money. And, and of course, you. Uh, sorry, Ben. I was just going to say the last thing to round that out is, um, of course, the double brick home. I mean, I, I remember the the culture shock. I left Perth in 2002. I went to Queensland and I saw these houses being built with just timber studs and um, plasterboard. And I'm thinking, where's the brick? These things are going to blow over. <laughs> <laughs> I also wanted to just put some extra context in regards to, um, you know, we know that the, the Sydney market is is basically more units or, or townhouses uh, per freestanding houses. Like I think the percentages are something like 52%, 40, 48% in the, mm -hmm. Sydney Basin. Um, that is a completely different story. Can you share with our listeners um, the percentages of people in units or, you know, in terms of stock sizes versus land? Because what we are talking about in Perth is always uh, by land in Perth uh, mm. as opposed to the unit market. It's just not, not mature at all, is it? No, the unit market's uh, a very shallow one, Ben. It's, uh, put, it's like Melbourne was probably in the 25 years ago in the mid 90s when I remember growing up there and uh, as a kid and uh, units and apartments there was a few in the sort of inner eastern areas here and there a few of the old 60s blocks but yeah. but uh, you know around South Bank and Docklands and uh, those areas was, was pretty much nothing but now of course Melbourne it's there's a massive amount of apartments no we've um, look if you're going to absolutely I agree if you're buying in Perth you want to you want to buy something with land because you don't have you can get something in a decent area around 400,000 with land. Uh, and it's gonna be, you know, you can get 1980s, 1990s cases, you know, near, not far from a train station, 400,000 with 700 meter blocks. So uh, certainly I think uh, apartments, if you wanna live in them and it's your lifestyle, I know plenty of baby boomers who are downsizing and that's for, great for lifestyle, but I think for investment, definitely stick with land in Perth. Thank you, good tip, thank you very much. So now can we get you to, to whack your uh, Rewa hat on, uh, mm. Real Estate Institute of WA. Um, how how uh, have you been coping through COVID nineteen, and and what are you seeing on the ground for your property managers and selling agents right now? I'll start with uh, with with sales, Ben. And uh, look, they've really dropped off uh, a cliff, and I guess that's pretty uh, pretty good reason for that. People are just going, well, I don't know what's going to happen, so I'm sitting on my hands. So our sales have dropped sixty five percent. Uh, from February into April, we're down to about 280 transactions a week. So, so uh, as yet, we haven't seen any any pricing pressure because there hasn't been a lot of full sales. We're already coming into a market that was um, a little bit undersupplied. But uh, common sense, demand and supply will tell you uh, uh, if there's uh, no demand and supply starts to come in, which it hasn't yet. The listings each week are really dropped off as well. 
that we you know, we can't get growth and potentially we could go backwards a little bit but how much that'll be will depend on how quickly we come out of it uh, property management of course that's been a, a huge issue uh, commercial and residential uh, across the um, industry because you know COVID-19 and, and Prime Minister announced no one can be evicted and uh, and and then of course a lot of tenants got well I can't be evicted I don't have to pay rent uh, and uh, so that was certainly a challenge uh, over here in the market and uh, and uh, look we, we go through I speak to a lot of agents and obviously I've got a rent roll also it's about um, somewhere between five and eight percent of tenants in arrear so not as bad commercial is, is far worse and uh, but it's just it's just about educating the tenants so we've uh, just this week had our legislation passed and uh, one of my fun roles as uh, REWA president was uh, getting on the phone and lobbying the uh, crossbench and we got some uh, good wins originally the proposals were that uh, uh, that you could uh, anyone could break a lease it wasn't just limited to COVID uh, related anyone could just break a lease now that I know over east uh, they don't tend to go with the fixed term leases as much but Perth certainly that's always been a fixed uh, fixed term lease place and uh, a lot of property managers are very concerned about that and, and we were too because it would just encourage if you sign a 12-month lease in January uh, you're on the hook so if you leave uh, you you've got to pay the agents uh, uh, the proportion of the re-letting fee and also if you can't let it you've got to pay for that vacant period and uh, uh, so certainly a lot of property managers and, and REWA were concerned that this would just encourage if we start to see rent spiral down uh, and just people will pack up and say well I can get a cheap one around the corner we were certainly very keen to support people suffering from COVID and they lost their jobs we get it uh, we're all going to do our part. All the industries have to play a part in that. But to uh, have it as a, just a simple break lease for everyone, we were not happy at all. But anyway, good news for investors in WA is you can break a lease without cost, but um, with 21 days notice, only if you're suffering financial hardship due to COVID. So we think that'll be um, a lot less people. The other one was evictions. It was a, originally pro prohibited all evictions regardless. And again, once again, that was encouraging tenants to go, well, I don't have to pay my rent. You can't do a damn thing. Now, fortunately, we got that amended albeit it's not as easy as it used to be in the, this COVID time, you still have to go through an arbitration or mediation session, I should say, with the commissioner uh, for consumer protection in their department, but you can still, if they're not suffering from COVID related issues, you can um, still evict them. Um, probably the most important thing in the legislation was there was no guarantee right of rent reduction. Uh, the tenant still owes the debt. So I think that's sitting on the mind of tenants who thought they were going to play the game is, well, you can play it now, but uh, you can, you're going to be evicted eventually and you're going to owe that debt. Um, so so overall, I think with the new legislation coming in, the message getting out to tenants, I think uh, uh, we're going to see yeah, rents aren't going to grow like we thought they would earlier in the year, but uh, I suspect that they will uh, they, they might, won't go down too much. They might, might hold since we've got a low vacancy rate. And uh, for most landlords, you'll, um, you'll get your uh, rent uh, and won't be affected. For some, unfortunately, will be affected. But if you've got landlord's insurance, uh, you, we still believe we can, we're able to claim on that. So that will help. So Damien, the devil is in the detail with what you were saying there around um, hardship um, and, and evidence of impact from COVID. Um, I've been asking this of all of the association presidents and CEOs around the country. How do we, ha have you had a clear layout from the government in terms of how a tenant demonstrates that? Because most governments are quite coy around, um, you know, sort of saying, well, this is what it looks like. And, you know, there's the whole privacy issue of, of people disclosing financials and so forth. Have you got any clarity from the government there in terms of what, what you see and, and the measures of hardship? Uh, no, we don't, Ben, which is disappointing. We, we wanted to put in the uh, a defi definition in the legislation. We wanted to put in financial hardship is deemed to be a 25% reduction in your household income. So not just one person, the household income. Yep. And we thought that was a fair measure. If you've dropped your income by 10 or 20%, well, you should be still able to pay your rent. Obviously, you're not going out as much and you can make sacrifices. But unfortunately, that didn't get up. We couldn't get that uh, through. So you're exactly right. You're left with this finance, says financial hardship. Now, obviously, in Victoria, you've got VCAT. We still use the magistrate's court here. Uh, and ultimately, that's where it's going to end up because, uh, look, it's common sense. I mean, it, it, what, what we're doing is if someone's legitimately lost their job, uh, look, we're encouraging them because they can, if you can go and live with family and friends, move out, we'll get a replacement tenant. That would be probably the preferred situation for a landlord because at least they can get someone in who can pay the rent. But uh, so it's going, it has to go um, uh, to, during the COVID time, has to go to the commission. Now, it's, 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 uh, it's mediation. It's not, so they're, they're going to sit there and I don't know what they're going to say because we haven't had to go there. The legislation's only gone through in the last two days. And if you don't agree there, 
then it goes to the magistrate's court. So, uh, and it's up to a magistrate. And our experience in the magistrate's court is you'll get five different magistrates with five different ideas about what it means. So it is an uncertain time. I think, uh, you know, everyone's trying to work on the basis that uh, uh, if a tenant can't pay uh, legitimately, um, then uh, you're better off to ask them if they can find an alternative accommodation with family or friends and try and release it because there's no point to mm. going down that, going down um, that, that particular path. And uh, um, so, yeah, it's quite, uh, it's quite challenging. And we'll find out, I think, in about three weeks when the first cases will start getting to the commissioner. And it's interesting, isn't it, right? Because if it goes to the commissioner, I, I want to know whether they're asking for an assets and liability position because, it, it, you know, we've been documenting in other podcasts around what if that tenant's got $50,000 in cash in the bank? Yeah. Now, now, so yes, I understand the material income issue is real. And I also understand that, you know, this is not through their own fault they're in this position, but nor is it the fault of the property owner um, yeah. that they're in their position as well. So, um, you know, seeing some precedences in terms of what is going to be accepted from the mediation point of view and from the judges and so forth in terms of striking that balance is, is going to be helpful, right, in terms of, you know, Victoria have already said that if you've got over five thousand dollars in savings, well, well, technically, um, you should be able to pay the rent in the short term until the uh, job, uh, job seeker or job keeper packages kick in. Um, because as you say, you, you can't go out to the pub, you can't, you can't spend discretionarily at the moment. So you know, you're hoping that to think that you know, being an essential need shelter, that that any tenant would would uh, set aside a certain amount of their income or their savings. Uh, for their most in, important need, which is that shelter. Well, you're exactly right, Ben. And this, this has been interesting. The uh, the uh, commissioner here uh, for consumer protection has said categorically we cannot ask for bank statements. They think that's beyond the uh, pale. They understand that uh, if tenants are you know, in financial hardship, we can ask for uh, you know letters from their employer showing that you've been stood down or laid off or whatever it might be, or your hours have been significantly cut, but they said categorically, we can't ask for bank statements. So just on that point, we had one of my uh, property managers was telling me the other day that a tenant saying, well, I've, you know, my, I've taken a cut in hours, so I'm down at 80% of time and I want a rent, re rent reduction and, and all this sort of stuff. And uh, so she asked her a few questions and uh, yeah, about, well, how are you going financially? And she said, oh yeah, I've got 10,000 in the bank, but that's for my holiday. So I'm, I'm not touching that. I was like, well, sorry, the land has also got a mortgage and uh, the bank doesn't say, oh, well, you, you have a separate savings account, you don't have to pay that part of your mortgage. So, so I agree. I think, uh, but they've been very clear here that um, we're, there's only so far we can go. And as you know, ASIC uh, uh, writes all the REIs, REIs around the country and uh, uh, super. about yeah. the super and said, uh, now agents, um, you know, certainly agents are allowed to tell people about here's all the programs you can go to the government, but agents were saying to people, um, you should take it out of your super, which is obviously a no-go area. Correct. So, yeah. Uh, so yeah, they're very, very challenging, Ben. And unfortunately, um, I think uh, uh, a lot, it's going to end up in the magistrate's court and there's going to be some disputes, unfortunately. In your application forms over there, you do ask about financial status because yep. um, you're trying to ascertain the, the quality of the tenant and, and their ability to, to service a loan. Um, as part of that, is there any investigations around the balance sheet? Uh, generally not. Generally, we look at uh, um, income, and so that's the because it's a rent and not needing a deposit. Obviously, for uh, yep. generally most uh, property managers definitely do uh, ask for pay slips. So this is at the time of application because you want to make sure, you know, if you've got a thousand dollar a week rental, you don't want someone uh, moving in there uh, who may not be able to pay the uh, may not be able to pay the rent. So you want to make sure they've got that capability to service it and uh, and. Uh, uh, fortunately, we here we still don't have some of the Victorian legislation that uh, you guys have around uh, tenants for life. But uh, you still want to make sure that uh, in that term of that first lease period, they can uh, they can pay that rent. So so you do have something on file, and uh, and tenants have been pretty good where they're legitimately in trouble. They've got the evidence, uh, uh, but the trouble is with these new laws, uh, there's no compulsion on them to provide to the property manager, but the commissioner, we got some other amendments we got through um, where the, the commissioner can request um, evidence and information to help in the mediation process. So that was at least a win there, but the pro we can't, as property managers, can't compel them to provide anything. So what is, um, you know, in terms of, what are some of the messages that you're, you know, if we take your rear hat off and talk about your business, um, you've got clients there who are coming to you for counsel about how they navigate through this. What's some of the messages that, uh, that you're sharing with them and uh, how are you, um, I guess, um, giving them comfort or, or 
cause for concern based on what, what mm. you see from your perspective? Well, certainly, um, Bryce, the, the first thing is uh, we say is uh, don't make any rash decisions in a uh, in a heat of the moment emotional. It's, it's an emotional decision right now. And uh, uh, so don't make any rash decisions. Sit down and look at your circumstances. The first thing uh, to do is uh, go and talk to your uh, mortgage broker. And, and obviously we have it in-house as, as, uh, as you guys do as well. And uh, try and see the interest rates are unbelievable. Uh, 2.29 fixed for three years, these sort of rates, uh, um, that could save you. And it's amazing how banks uh, manage to creep up your loan interest rate. Uh, they're, they're pretty sneaky about that. You take out this really good deal up front and then three or four years later, somehow you're about half a percentage point or more above what the, uh, they're offering to new customers. So, so go and talk to your broker, see if you can get your better loan situation and get your payments down. The banks have been very good about interest only, even the switching P&I to interest only. And, and from what I understand, it's early days yet that um, uh, even extensions on interest only that were meant to come onto P&I, they've been pretty good about that. ASIC came out and said, uh, which was great, that it's uh, switched from P&I to interest only or vice versa is not uh, credit advice under the yep. responsible lending. So that, yep. that's been good. Um, and the second thing is, of course, is, uh, um, look, if you've got a tenant in place now, obviously we want to try and hold them. Uh, even though properties are still leasing okay, but if it's a good tenant, we're obviously trying to hold them. So so uh, maybe it's worth dropping 5 or $10 or $15 um, a week if, you, if, they're, you know, if they're sort of say, saying they're going to go. Maybe in this market, your cash flow is a bit more concerning. You want to make sure you hold on to them. And for those who aren't getting rent where the tenants aren't paying, look, they've generally been pretty good about it. Uh, they understand. And uh, we've, uh, it's always been a, a policy of ours that uh, we want our, all our landlords to take out uh, landlords insurance for these sort of needs. Landlords insurers have been a bit difficult to deal with. Um, but now that the legislation has come out um, and uh, we can't, just you know, a victim with uh, 21 days notice, and um, uh, they're, they're covering it. So they said, if you're following, uh, making efforts to work with the tenant, even to get rent deferrals, uh, they will cover us for up to six weeks, and uh, with one of the insurers that we, um, many of our clients use. So, so you will hopefully get some of that money back. And uh, so it's not a uh, not a market for uh, making rash decisions. Uh, interestingly, on the buy side, I. I, uh, we've had a few bargain hunters come in, but uh, the bargains aren't just there yet. I haven't seen enough. Uh, uh, you can, if you want a great property for long run, they're there, but the, we haven't seen for selling because I think the banks are, people are holding off selling unless they need to, and the banks are capitalising interest for people. So I don't think we're going to see a lot of for selling, certainly not in the next month or two. Um, so Damien, in terms of um, putting your rewa hat back on again, What's happening from a tenancy reform point of view? We've also been going around the grounds on this point because before COVID, um, it was definitely a hot topic. Um, we've seen some pretty radical um, sort of policy uh, decisions here in Victoria and we're starting to see, you know, New South Wales um, was successful in, um, in a no reasons clause being retained. We know uh, Queensland is going to have that challenge come up and and we'll be talking to all property investors about that because we think that that's diabolical. Um, what's what's going on over there in terms of the rental reforms that you're seeing? Uh, that's, that's a good uh, point, Ben. We've uh, at the moment we've got a a paper out came out late uh, early early this year, January of 2020, and it said uh, it was a uh, uh, the headline of it said um, uh, your house, my home. Uh, and so that sort of uh, told you where they were going with it. It's might be your house as an investment, but it's my home as the tenant. And uh, and uh, it was very much along the lines of uh, the tenancies are going to be there for life. And look, I, I think some of the stats they used st stats from a uh, think tank out of uh, out of uh, over east, and it said, oh, you know, in 30, 40 years ago, uh, 60 percent of 25 to 30 year olds, 34 year olds owned their own home. Or bought had bought a home obviously with a mortgage. Mm -hmm. Nowadays it's only thirty nine percent, and oh, so all these people are going to be renting for life. But my argument is, well, it's a lifestyle change. Back thirty something years ago, uh, I know my parents. They were, you know, like I'm sure your parents as well. All got married very young and had kids very young, and and bought a house. That was what you did in your early twenties. Whereas these days, no one, hardly anyone in their twenties buys a house. They're enjoying life. They're renting. It's not about um, affordability so much. I mean, certainly that's that's a challenge in some areas, but it's it's lifestyle choice. So. So they've framed it around the fact that everyone's going to be renting and so we need to give tenants security of tenure. And one of those positions, it's it's a discussion paper uh, and they put up some of the options was that uh, exactly what uh, Victoria, and they referenced Victoria and they like to pick and uh, 
pick and choose the uh, jurisdictions that suit their, um, I guess, their, their case. Uh, and the, the whole point of uh, without reason, no reason evictions. Now, we're certainly going to fight that uh, tooth and nail. We've looked at the discussion paper, some things we think uh, we can live with, um, uh, we can let go through to the keeper, but there's, that's one of the ones that we're going to fight tooth and nail for because it is still my property as a landlord and I've been a landlord and a tenant and it's still the owner's property. And uh, uh, sometimes uh, you know, my argument to the uh, minister when I spoke to him was, uh, uh, well, I can go home today and uh, divorce my wife for no grounds. Um, if you're watching, Jen, I'm not going to, but um, uh, <laughs> if, um, you can go home and divorce your spouse, no grounds, no reason. Um, yet I have to have a reason. Sometimes you're tenant and you just don't get along. Like, And uh, I think it'll encourage difficult tenants because if they know that they can't uh, be evicted, they're going to be really painful. And sometimes you have irreconcilable differences with your tenant and you just sort of say, I want to move on. And uh, to, to remove that right, I think, is uh, you know really a massive restriction on, on, on people's rights, property rights. So Super we'll be, dangerous. Yep. Yeah, we'll be fighting that tooth and nail. And um, I've, the good thing here is the, the WA Labor government are pretty centrist as a general rule. Um, uh, you can't be too far left wing uh, in WA. It's a pretty uh, conservative uh, pro-business sort of state. So the government itself is pretty centrist. Uh, we've spoken to some of the, the ministers and they're pretty centrist and understand. Uh, so, and, they are, and they don't have the majority in the upper house anyway. So uh, we, they've got to get it through a couple of Cross benches. Uh, so I, I'm holding out hope we can kill that one off. And I think with the uh, the PR campaign, if they put that up as legislation, uh, we'll run a pretty strong campaign to kill that one off. Well, look, that's great news for all of the uh, the, the property investment owners in WA, and also uh, for any budding property investors who's listened to Damien's comments around opportunities in the WA market. Because the reality is, is yes, WA will not stay flat forever. Um, so that's good news for, for our listeners in terms of uh, whether they're running the ruler over WA, that you've got an association there um, who is taking a common sense approach and um, very similar to Picker's common sense approach is we think that, yep, potentially there was some adjustments that needed to be made to give tenants a little bit more control and a little bit more uh, balance in the conversation. But there are, there are things like the, the no reasons clause, which we feel are incredibly dangerous and, and don't then accommodate an open market and, and the unintended consequences are going to be significant um, in Victoria and, and they'll see that happen. So, and if no other, no other states following suit like New South Wales haven't followed suit, but we now know that WA and also Queensland are running the rules over that it's really important that we get behind that story as well. So we appreciate that. And, and obviously Picker will be working hand in glove uh, with Rewa um, to try and make sure that, uh, that we get a balanced outcome um, because unfortunately here, the politics um, was too strong um, in regard to um, the Labor Party down here trying to, uh, you know, sort of uh, beat off the Greens. Um, and, and so the tenancy policy was real because it was marginal seats involved. So, you know, from that point of view, we take the pol politics out. We should hopefully get to better policy um, that will look after, you know, all, uh, all landlords in Victoria as well. So time will tell whether that plays out. So um, appreciate that. Uh, in terms of um, anything else inside those reform policies that, that, you, uh, that you're concerned about, uh, you know, tenants having pets and alike? Yeah, Ben, that's another one is uh, your tenant has a right to a pet. And uh, look, I think if you want to have a pet and, uh, and 30 plus percent of properties, I believe, at, at least have a, a pet, that's a discussion between the landlord and the tenant. I think, uh, you know, one of the uh, in the uh, one of the uh, discussion papers, uh, the way that it's, it's framed is uh, uh, you're allowed a animal. And, it, it, and that's defined as any animal except a service animal. Service dog, obviously, if you're blind, you're, of course, got that uh, that right to it. Well, what happens if you're in a one-bedroom apartment and someone wants a, a Dalmatian? I mean, uh, uh, you know, maybe the neighbour's going to hear it barking all night. I, I just think it's 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 a, it's a matter between the landlord and the tenant, and you go into it wise wide open if you are a tenant and uh, you know that that landlord says no to pets. Well, that's the way it is. You need to move to another property. And so we're certainly going to fight that one. Now, I challenge you that one. Ben, is that uh, once again, they've um, looked around and good old Victoria and other places and uh, they're basically telling us that one's a fait accompli, that there's, uh, they're going to push through with pets being, you know, again, on this basis that everyone's going to live in rentals for life. So that's uh, problematic for us and uh, we're, we're going to fight that one, but their position is they're willing to listen on some of the other things, but that one they seem pretty much unless 
uh, unless we can massively convince them otherwise, that's going to come in, which I think uh, if, if we can't get that uh, blocked, which we want to, we will want to see strict conditions uh, to limit it to the number of pets, certainly one. Uh, you want someone with 17 dogs and, uh, and limit it to size based on, uh, you know, if it's uh, a strata property, uh, you know, maybe it's got to be a six kilo animal. I don't know. These are the sort of things we're going to have to address. We'd love to kill it off, but if we get it through, if it gets through, we want to make sure it's very tightly controlled about the, the number and the size of pets you can have. Uh, the wear and tear on the property is material, right? Uh, especially if you've got a property with, you know, polished floorboards and you've got a significantly heavy dog with uh, claws. Um, you know, some of that soft timber pine floors uh, get absolutely smashed. So, you know, whether they allow for the pets to come through or there's a provision or an allowance or a bond, a pet bond um, for damage to the property could also uh, be something that we would like to see in legislations that are, that are being finalised here in Victoria and also around the other states where that has come in. So I think we can, we can strike a balance um, on that, um, you know, to give, uh, the, you know, in a lot of cases, animals provide, you know, mental health uh, benefits uh, to, to their tenants. So I, I think there is a way of getting that balance right. But, but I agree with you in terms of any pet um, is dangerous and multiple pets um, is going to, you know, cause significant wear and tear on that particular property. And, and you know, the fact that they won't disclose that then get the pets and animals rolling in later on is obviously difficult for, uh, for any type of landlord to be able to deal with. So I think there's, you know, validity in you guys sort of saying, I'm not really sure that, you know, this is good policy. Well, particularly if you co couple that with uh, no evictions, uh, no reasons, uh, yeah. uh, basically the, the tenants uh, got your house. And again, I, I, I get that some it is a tenant's home and there's some other changes in legislation about tenants being able to fix things, or sorry, in the proposal, it's not legislation yet, in the discussion paper, about tenants being able to fix things to walls. And look, generally, by and large, we're okay with those sort of things. That mm, I get that it is, is a tenant's home, but certainly the pets and the no reasons, uh, ban on no reason evictions is, is very problematic for us. Hey, uh, Damien, you've been really generous with your time. We appreciate that. Uh, my, my final question for you is um, around your agenda for being involved at Rewa there. Clearly, clearly you're a successful uh, business owner and runner. Um, you've, you've, you're a property investor and have been for some time. So what, what sort of agendas does a president um, like yourself want to see uh, implemented on your watch over, over, the, over your term and perhaps um, seeking re-election? What, what are some of the things that you hope to achieve in your time as president of REWA? Well, Bryce, one of the main things I want to get on the agenda is is stamp duty reform. And uh, it's, a, it's a shocking tax. Um, it's a barrier for people to move and it doesn't tax wealth, it taxes for pass and go. And, you know, you look in a market like Sydney and Melbourne, when you have those big run-ups, 60, 70% over, you know, three or four years, people go, well, I'm going to move house, um, yeah, but I'm up 60%, so I'll, we'll move and, uh, you know, we're going to lose 5% stamp duty, few percent agents fees and, and those sort of things. Uh, and people still will move. But if you're in a market like Perth, where the market has not moved for, for 13 years, someone who bought a house for 450000 10 years ago is probably still in that situation. It's worth four fifty, and if they'd borrowed 80 90%, they don't have a lot of equity. And so to then to move to another suburb, let's say they get a job different part of uh, Perth that they need to move for, um, they're going to be whacked another twenty grand in stamp duty just for passing go. It's a shocking Shocking tax. Every economist calls it the worst, of all the taxes, the worst and most inefficient. So one of the things we want to get on the agenda is a broad a reform to the land tax. Now, that will mean that uh, you're going to have to pay more of an annual fee and less of a transactional fee. But uh, we'd love the government to get rid of it and not replace it with land tax. But uh, I think, um, uh, unfortunately, that uh, they're going to need the money from somewhere. So I want to get that on the agenda. It's going to be a long haul. And my discussions with both sides of politics, they're actually for it, for reform. But the problem is it's easy to scare people. And I know ACT have gone down that path. And I saw recently New South Wales, the government's going to look at something like that. I think it needs bipartisanship because it's easy to scare people and go to the, go to the election and say, oh, they're going to put a tax on your house, you have to pay every year. That's, a, that's certainly from a legislative agenda. Uh, and from, a, from an industry agenda, it's really about modernisation. Uh, we've seen uh, what COVID has done, I guess, is uh, yeah, we're on a Zoom call now and, uh, and uh, even, um, you know, the, the ways that people are doing inspections, uh, you know, the, the 3D, autumn, 3D tours, uh, they were just starting to come in, but it was only used sporadically. Of course, now agents showing homes, uh, you go onto the, uh, the portals and you can do the, three, you know, the, the 3D walkthroughs in the, 
with the uh, Matterport type cameras that the um, agencies are using. And and uh, people don't want to, you know, wait till Saturday between 2 p.m. and 2.15 p.m. to view a property. They want information that when they're sitting in their lounge room, they want to see property. So it's about making sure that the agents modernise and agents as, as an industry are still a respected and trusted part of that transaction. will be more efficient uh, about way properties are leased and uh, managed and uh, will certainly be uh, more efficient the way the properties are sold and bought. But we want to make sure as an industry, and my role as REWA, is make sure agents are still vital to that transaction advisors. That's what they need to be. If you're a ticket clipper, uh, you're going to disappear in this uh, modern world. If you're actingly giving advice to the seller, if you're a, a selling agent or a buyer, uh, to the, if you're a buyer's agent, uh, then you're going to be, people are going to be happy to pay the fees. And that's, and that's important, making sure our industry uh, stays, um, stays modern and becomes trusted advisors uh, rather than just a ticket clipper transaction. Transactional people, is, which they're not, but that's how a lot of the world sees real estate agents is, uh, and why they're not um, so popular. They're down there with a slightly ahead of uh, financial planners and, the, uh, and, uh, and politicians in the trust scale, but uh, a long way off doctors and nurses. They're, uh, they're a long way down the trust list. And I think that's something that it's a long a long game, but that's something I really want to get uh, back into our industry as agents being seen as advisors. Oh, good. And nowhere near as low as Collingwood supporters, but uh, Ben, you've got a final. <laughs> boom, boom. <laughs> um, in terms of, well, my final question is on the same front around reform. Uh, with a population of 25 million people and, um, you know, I, I know I'm, I'm sort of barking up the, the wish tree here in terms of having a, a centralised uh, land titles arrangement for a nation as opposed to the uh, eight states and territory land titles. Uh, I know I'm, that's that's probably too big a uh, too big an apple to, uh, to chew into. But uh, what I would love to see is uniformity around uh, training and and legislation in terms of um, licensing across the country. I, I know we went there once before, but do you have a view on that, Damien, in terms of, I, I realise that with the different land titles laws that the specialisation is still required, but my goodness, it's just quite difficult in terms of, you know, talking about mobility and people wanting to move states and new mm. opportunities and, and, you know, the qualifications and all that don't carry or do carry. And have you got a view on that? Yeah, that's a, that's a good point, Ben. There, there is a process at the moment to uh, harmonise the, uh, the the courses. And we, we, look, we went down the path of national licensing, would have been about, um, might have been seven or eight years ago now. And oh, yeah. yeah, and the reason it didn't get up is because uh, the other, the, the, effectively the, the, the benchmark was the New South Wales uh, course, which was uh, considered by many to be, uh, you know, something out of a Wheaties box. And so that's why it didn't get up. It wasn't about improving the industry. Uh, a lot of, uh, institutes outside of New South Wales, including Victoria's Institute and WA, felt this is dumbing it down. And so we want to get actually better, more professional as an industry. We're dealing with someone's biggest asset. So we wanted to see the uh, the educational standards increase. So that all fell over. We do have mutual recognition, but it's still painful. Uh, if you want to go into another state, if you're a business in Victoria, you want to buy property in New South Wales, you're technically meant to be licensed there. And it gets very messy. WA is still uh, uh, challenging. I think you're meant to have an office here. And so it's all, all over the shop. And I think, as you say, mobility, uh, it, it sh we should, I think, go, go to more of a, um, if the system, if there was a, a common standard, I think the institutes would be for it. If there was a common standard and a high standard of education, ongoing training, uh, that was across the country, I think you'd find there would be institute support. But and I, Look, I definitely see New South Wales has uh, identified that. And, and, you know, seven years ago to where we are today, um, you know, they are talking about a, a very high standard as opposed to, you exactly right, Leanne was talking about it was out of a Wheaties packet and it was too easy barrier of entry to get into the industry and that meant, you know, any any man and dog could have a go at it and, and that was where the reputational damage comes in. So I think you're right. I think it's time for a review of that um, and those minimum standards lifting the professionalism of the, of the industry, that would be incredibly helpful uh, for all parties involved. That'll, that'll mean you've got better quality educated selling agents and better quality educated buyers agents and and that means better outcomes for customers. So um, yep. hopefully, uh, hopefully you guys can um, can put your heads together and, and work out what that minimum standard is, raise it to the highest level you can, and, and get on with the job, which will be you know beneficial for all parties. Yeah, I think it's coming, Ben. As I said, we've been there's a, there's a national framework. All the REIs talking to each other, uh, and and about uh, the educational standard is increasing. Uh, and, and so I think that will 
if we get a good standard, we're all happy with this educational, I think then the, 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 the domino to fall would be towards more of that national licensing. And, and it makes sense, makes sense. Yeah, it does. Thank you. Well, mate, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, if you want to learn out more about Damien Collins and uh, his business over in WA, Momentum Wealth um, is a wealth of knowledge. Um, Damien and his team are also uh, doing some real estate investment trust activities. Um, that is definitely something from our point of view in terms of a future show that we want to explore. So um, we look forward to having you on later in the year um, in terms of, of what that looks like as well. But we appreciate you coming on again to the property couch, mate. Pleasure, Ben. Pleasure, Bryce. Good to, good to see you both. And uh, I'll just go back to the AFL ladder and see who's sitting in second spot. <laughs> after, was, one, was, after, one round, after one round, we're the percentage of I was waiting waiting for it. I was waiting for it. Normally, I, normally I throw to the end, but I just thought I'd leave, leave you two peas in the same pot having a go over good, there. Good thing, Damo, we won't be June premiers, right, like we used to be, where we, exactly. <laughs> we start really well. No, Damien, all, all I can say to you, Damien, is if, uh, if you guys are as good as you are, we've poached a Collingwood um, coach to be our head coach. So if you're as good as you guys say you are, we should win our premiership pretty soon. <laughs> good luck. Well, I do have a soft spot for the Dockers over here, I must say. So um, let's hope, Bryce, that... Uh, ah. They, um, uh, well, I, I go to some of the games. So I, I do hope that uh, they're, they're, off, they're on my top three. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, yeah, is that Ben? <laughs> Normally your second and third are the teams you feel the most sorry for, Bryce. Yeah, that's, that's pretty that's much true exactly as well for the rest exactly. of the show. I feel sorry for them. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, with no premierships in the, uh, in the cupboard, I've got nowhere to go on that. But again, I, I echo Ben's sentiments. Thanks for coming on and joining us on the Property Couch. It's been 210 episodes since you've been on. We won't make it that long the next time. Good on you guys. Great to be here. See ya. So there you go, Ben. Another insightful chat. It's the second time we've had uh, Damien on to our podcast. Uh, in fact, he's featured uh, uh, as our very first vodcast, which I mentioned in that particular interview. But um, yeah, really good insights from someone who's been at the coalface of a market that um, has certainly uh, just returned to balance prior to the COVID-19 after being um, in, a, in a downturn market for some time. Well, that's right. I mean, when we say return to balance, I mean, basically the, the declines are slowing, um, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, their peak to trough and where they're at, there's still a fair bit to go there. But some positive signs, right? I mean, I think I think for a marketplace that we've always said, um, not yet, not yet, not yet. Um, you, you know, if we hadn't had COVID-19, uh, we were talking about the second half of this year being a market um, that would have got, caught our attention on a couple of fronts uh, in terms of the affordability story in certain pockets, uh, the infrastructure story in certain pockets and the price point uh, for some entry-level investors. So I think if you are an entry-level investor, but you also need to understand that, yeah, you know, effectively uh, more broadly mining and indirectly it makes a significant uh, um, uh, sort of contribution to the economic activity yeah. of, of Perth and WA that's the risk you take in going into that particular market. So yeah. I think, you know, for the, for the right type of, um, of investor um, who's also looking to spread their risk across their portfolio, um, it's something that you shouldn't automatically dismiss. It should be something that you would, uh, you would look at. So I really appreciated that bit. And, and obviously there's more to add in regards to, um, in regards to the rent and tenancy relief program um, that we'll get an update from Damien on. Uh, soon so i think from that point of view it's uh, it's really good uh, very good and i'm not sure if you would have picked this up ben but there's a very subtle swing in uh, the conversation that damien had and uh only the really educated and and sort of well healed would have picked it up but it sounded like he was swinging from collingwood to the dockers towards the oh, end oh really uh, really yeah didn't so, used to say and, anything about insights as you know well, what did you just say before about you know taking action on insights is really important i think you've missed the mark on the insight there mate i'm not sure whether he, I think he, what he said is he enjoys going to a game that's not West Coast. Yeah. And yeah. in a two, in a two-team state, the reality is he's only got another team to go after, right? And he's got to go and host people in his professional capacity. So That's just the he, way you saw it, Ben. I saw it a different <laughs> way. I mean, I, I, most of us give you Collingwood supporters a little bit of extra slack just to catch up. So but that's cool. But um, we appreciate that Damien uh, gave up his time to come and educate our community, Ben, um, on all things... Um, uh, Western Australia on all things, uh, how the how the uh, the COVID environment is impacting that market. And as you did say, we are going to circle back and close the loop on the renter assistance package because they uh, they will have re released that, which they hadn't done. But when we were having the conversation, 
Um, but we're certainly looking forward to closing the loop on that. So we, we thank Damien for his time. We Beautiful. certainly appreciate it. We did. He's great. As, as uh, one of the friends on the property couch. Hey, my life hack today is from one of our team, Ben, Virginia. Um, and Virginia, as you know, Ben, we're all in a work from home environment. So Virginia, let me know that uh, one of her isolation life hacks uh, may be relevant to some people that are listening to this because she lives on her own in a one bedroom apartment. So there's no separate office um, for her to actually separate work from, from non-work. So what she does is to, a little trick to get her mind off work at the end of the day is when she finishes, she goes for a walk. And when you get back, it's kind of like coming home from work and you can get on with your usual nighttime routine. Um, and she said, look, it really does work. So we have had a, a couple of um, isolation tips. One was what you do in the morning. This one here was what uh, Virginia's doing in the evening. And um, she said that it really works. And I know that a lot of our listeners um, may be in scenarios where they live on their own or they're in environments where they have uh, cramped uh, living versus working. So I thought that was a really good tip from uh, Virginia. And hopefully that's uh, helpful for the crew who are listening to this as well, which is really, really good. Now, Ben. Very, very good. Thank you. Before I, well, before I throw to you for Did You Know, I just wanted to say that um, haven't done a little shout out for um, reviews on our podcast on on the platforms mm -hmm. for a little while, yep. uh, but they're also they're always very helpful, Ben. We've been very yes. blessed that we've had heaps and heaps of reviews, which has been great. Um, so we're, we're open to all sorts of reviews, Ben. We, our preference is five stars, but if you feel like you're <laughs> going to give us one star, um, that would that would be totally fine. We'd love to see um, some feedback. So I just wanted to shout out if anyone. Um, who's been listening to us for a long time and they've received value uh, from our podcast, we'd certainly love for you to take the time just to give us a little review, Ben. Uh, and what uh, Stiggy and I have been chatting about is maybe we might read a couple out um, uh, over the next couple of episodes. And um, we've we've developed a, a course, Ben, called Start and Build. So we might mm. give away some courses for folks that uh, we read out. Now, it, it can be comical, it can be funny, it can be whatever you want to say. And as I said, if, um, but just a little shout out to the community. If you help us with um, the the iTunes algorithm, it would be certainly appreciated if you could uh, leave us a review. Ben, did you know? Did you know, Bryce? Well, I thought I would. There's obviously a lot of uh, murmurs out there, Bryce, around property yeah. price crashes and, you know, disasters in the market and et cetera, yeah. et cetera. So I thought I'd just... Um, I got uh, a nice little slide from the National Australia Bank, Bryce. Um, okay. National Australia Bank uh, released their uh, their results. Um, yeah. you know, bit of a tough tough trading environment at the moment. Uh, yeah. But uh, one slide slide definitely caught my interest, which is uh, the the slide about distressed uh, mortgage holders, Bryce. I mean, ultimately, um, mm. I caught your your video, your your uh, Facebook live with Merit Connorsby, the chief economist from REA you did, Group. Did you? Wow. And and you know we're talking about who is in a you know where's all of this correction going to come from and most people think it's going to come from people who are in distressed situations Bryce where they're forced sellers and they're going to take any price right but as I've said to you before and as I've known and you know one of my keen interests is behavioral economics it and is. you know and loss aversion is a real behavior it's a, basically mm -hmm. in the psychology of people and, and a lot of people don't like to lose money, Bryce. So mm. that loss aversion thing is is so, certainly something that I think showing up where, as we've also said to people, they shouldn't be selling their houses if they don't need to in this particular case. Not a, not a great time to be selling. Um, but effectively what I wanted to talk about was repayment buffers. So this great little slide that came up from our good friends at NAB, and I mm. just want to put it into context. This, is, this represents payments in advance by yep. accounts including offset, but it does exclude accounts in arrears or at advantage book or lines of credit. So it's not people who have got buffers in terms of loan buffers. These are people who have got their hard-earned bros, their mm -hmm. cash mm -hmm. in, the, in their accounts, right? And I just wanted to share with you the percentage of people um, who have got these, these amounts, right? Here we go. Ready? Yep, so. Ready. Greater than two years, Bryce. So this basically means they've got an over two years of savings mm -hmm. in their offset account. What percentage of people do you think would have greater than two years of money in their account? Bearing in mind also that NAB represents about 15% of all home loan market. Right. So it's 
between 10 and 15% is their market share. So we are talking an enormous amount of borrowers here. What do you mm. reckon it is? Have a guess, have a stab in it up. Greater than two years. Uh, in, sitting in their offset account, I think yep. not, I, I, I think a large percentage of the people don't have an emergency fund, but having sit, sitting in their offset account, I would have thought two years would be reasonably rare. Mm -hmm. Give me a number, stab in the dark. And you can't look over my shoulder and cheat now, so this is good. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'll give you a number. I'll give you a number as uh, 11%. 32% Bryce. 32% mm. of borrowers with the National Australia Bank have greater than two years reserves to oh, meet their financial Isn't... commitments, right? Yeah. That should be a message for everyone who's hearing all of this. 30% of the mortgage holders are in stress and they can't afford to make their money. Mm. Between one and two years, Bryce is 7%. One mm. to two years, 7%. Mm -hmm. Three months to 12 months, 14 percent 14 percent one to three months 13 percent less than one month 15 percent on time 15 percent mm. and three percent are behind Bryce three mm. percent mm. so if that doesn't give you some level of comfort in now the other what stat, period is that what period is that that's now Bryce that's March 2020 mm. that is March. 2020. Yeah. In, right? the peak is, of the pandemic. Yeah. in the peak of the pandemic, there's a lot of people doing really well um, with organising and managing them. Because remember, to have any serious correction in the property market price, we need a wave. We need a significant portion of households to be in distress to yeah. sell that. Now, we have also a repayment pause. Um, and I've got other data that I'll be sharing with a little opinion piece that I'm putting together, a little, little document that I'm putting together to prosecute mm -hmm. the case of why I've been calm right through this whole period in terms mm -hmm. of what's going to happen to property prices because I'm still, I still remain calm, I still remain quietly optimistic, and when we're out the other side of this, of what I've always said is that there will be pent-up demand and pent-up demand and limited supply usually results in price appreciation. So I'll, yeah. I'll just, I'll reserve that call. I haven't made the call in terms of which month I expect property prices to start growing again. But right now, property prices are holding up resiliently. You just need to go and look at the core logic results that have come out recently. Um, mm -hmm. So it bodes well um, for a pretty resilient property market and certainly can... not a volatile property market. Hey, look, Ben, I can, I can back that up um, in the weeds on the ground. Tactically, we have more buyers at the moment in terms of our client list than we have investment-grade properties that we can buy. And that is with a national uh, outlook. That's a, yeah. that's a borderless outlook. So it's not like just a little patch where we're saying, all oh, this that's across the country. There is not enough uh, investment-grade properties to buy right now. So the demand in the type of properties that we would buy exceeds supply mm -hmm. so uh and part of that is a waiting game for us to wait for the right properties to come on and at some point in time when people are deciding not to sell their house through the pandemic they'll get through the other side but there's there's you know prices prices dropping ben as is when supply uh exceeds demand it's just mm -hmm. on the ground that is just not the conditions that exist mm -hmm. for investment grade properties ben let's be Correct. clear Yes, Not there's going to be junk stock. Is. There's going to be yep. stock. There's going to be medium and high density stuff, which is going to be offloaded. There's going to mm -hmm. be house and land package stuff that's going to be offloaded. There's going to be those properties that are going to be offloaded in areas where there's really high vacancy rates. Mm -hmm. um, and that's out of Western Sydney that we've heard from Nerida as well. So there are pockets of distress. Don't get us wrong. And, mm -hmm. and they will show up in those in that, that locale data but they won't necessarily show up more broadly. Not to say that there won't be, you know, a 5% correction in property prices, maybe even pushing to 7%, um, you know, 10 at worst. But at the moment, um, I'm quietly optimistic that we'll start to see um, open houses and public auctions in the next month or so, um, which bodes well to what Leanne Pilkington told us about. Um, a lot of buy a lot of sellers waiting to see what's happening and, and that bodes well for a September uh, period or, or potentially better supply coming on. 
So let's just wait and see. I'm not calling it, uh, but things are looking okay for the time being. Um, and then, you know, in our episode on Thursday, I'm going to be really talking up um, the COVID safe app. I really want to talk to that in more detail. We just can't do that now uh, because the time has run up. It has run up very good, Ben. So thanks for that. Uh, did you know? Um, clearly, that gives people some confidence around what we're doing. But, um, folks, um, we are committed to bringing you as much quality uh, content as we can through this time. So uh, if you have liked the information, please put it on social, share it, send the link to someone who you think might benefit from listening to it. And uh, again, we appreciate the time, energy and effort that uh, not only Damien uh, has provided us in this episode, Ben, but the, the previous three presidents uh, in the last uh, week and a half as well. So it's been a really fun time for us to, to get around. And for those states that we've missed, Ben, um, they're certainly not forgotten. We will uh, reach out to those presidents at some stage so we can get three them presidents podcast. and one CEO. It's been a good yeah. wrap up so far, and and that's what we plan to do is to continue to keep bringing you the latest and greatest information on the ground as it happens. Felt exactly. Like so, uh, I felt like a news reporter then. Uh, so you're doing a good job, Ben. So, um, but until next and week. Likewise, knowledge is empowering, Bryce, but only if you act on it. Good stuff. See you next week, folks. Hey there folks, Bryce Holdaway here. Before you go, if you're new to our community and are only listened to maybe a handful of episodes, I thoroughly recommend that you go all the way back to episode number one, where we unpack all of the foundations when it comes to property investing. Now for those of you that might be a little bit time poor, I've got good news for you. We have a binge guide that you can download straight away, which summarizes the first 20 episodes where Ben and I unpack the foundational pillars of the A, B, C, D, and so much more. And you can get that straight away. If you go to thepropertycouch.com.au forward slash TPC20, you can download it and consume it whenever you want. It's completely free and available now. And for those of you, just a quick reminder that nothing we've spoken about today constitutes financial advice. We recommend that you reach out to your licensed professional advisor so that you can look at your unique circumstances before acting on any information. Now don't forget, go to thepropertycouch.com.au forward slash TPC20 and get your binge guide today.